Hello there. Hopefully I'm now streaming live. My name is Kat Davidson. I am a bird and nature guide with the Nala Nature Tours and I'm based down in Bruni Island in Tasmania. And I've come today to gush to you about our glorious island and the wonderful birds that live here. Uh, but firstly, I'd just like to acknowledge and pay respect to the Tasmanian Aboriginal community as the traditional and original owners and continuing custodians of the land. So I'm imagining that amongst the audience, there are quite a few people who may have visited Tasmania or may wish to visit Tasmania and have a fair idea of where it is at the bottom of the world here. Um, it is glorious in all respects and I could spend forever gushing about our mammals and our plants as well as our birds, but making it unique compared to other parts of Australia is of course the fact that it is an island. So all of Australia is an island and has a lot of endemic birds unique to Australia. And Tasmania has its own 12 endemics that are unique to, to Tasmania alone. The Bass Strait between Australia and Tasmania is only been full of water for the last 10 to 12,000 years since the last ice age. So during the last ice age, 30,000 years ago, so much of the world's ice was held in ice, so much of the world's water was held in ice, that the sea level was about 120 meters lower than it is today. So it was land between Australia and Tasmania. So over the last 10,000 years, we have been separated by the Bass Strait. And so that has led to evolution of our uh, plants and birds and animals into more unique ways. Now I'll be clicking through some slides and this first one shows all of our 12 endemics done in a beautiful stylized way by the fabulous Jane Cousins from Red Parker. And sometimes as I'm sure you know as birders that you sometimes want a photograph to reference and sometimes you want an illustration and she's done a lovely thing here where she's really drawn out some of the diagnostic features that I'll mention as we go through. So when we get people coming to visit Tasmania to see the birds, the 12 endemics are of course the ones they very much want to see if they haven't seen them elsewhere, but we have masses of other wonderful birds. The native hen is often the very first one that someone may see as an endemic when they arrive. And soon after that, they will learn that nobody calls it the native hen, they call it the turbo chook. Now this bird is completely flightless. And so to compensate for that, it can run like bilio. It has been recorded at up to 48 kilometers an hour. So well over Usain Bolt kind of speeds. And it's a handsome, handsome bird. And you can see its colors look fairly gray brown, but then the sun hits it just right and it glows with purples and greens as well. It's a glorious bird. They are often very tricky to photograph because they don't sit still very much. And so this one's hooning out of screen already. But then you hit lucky on a place where they are lurking around every corner and you see that they're in family groupings often. There's some very unique features to the Tasmanian native hen, and one of them is that it often lives in polyandrous communities. So there will be one female with several males. It has been found the other way around as well, but, um, and you will get monogamous relationships too, but they seem to be willing to put the fighting on the back burner if it's for the benefit of the family group and the survival of the chicks, and they will all help with the raising of the chicks. You can see that gorgeous white wing bar showing out clearly there too. That's another lovely diagnostic. And a bit of good Tasmanian weather that they're preening through. That was it. Real mountain. Karawangs. Now, if you visited Cradle Mountain, you would have met the Karawang. And um, please forgive my accent. I know I pronounce Karawang in a weird way. Apparently I've got far too much roll going on in my R's there, but you will have karawangs where you are in Australia. Often people will know the pied karawang best of all. And the black has this magnificent beak, really, really strong and bald and that amazing yellow eye. The only thing that you can mix him up with down here is the gray karawangs. Ah, 
this is just to show where you will most likely have met them is around picnic tables because they have learned sadly that humans equal food and now even though these wonderful please don't feed the bird signs are up everywhere they have learned tactics like coming stealth bomber over your shoulder while you're looking the other way and grabbing something out of your mouth so they're incredibly smart the gray karawan the one on the right there has got a more pointed bill not quite so bulky and then you can see under the tail there those under tail coverts around the vent they are very nice and white making a nice clear distinction the gray has got many different variations around australia so you may know the gray karawang as being more gray than the black one that's on the screen there but also photographs can look a little tricky by the way, as we go through, I am putting the photographer's name down on the white bar because we get given these glorious photographs by so many of our guests generously to use for Inala. So I always very much wish to acknowledge their fantastic work. Next one along is the green rosella. Now, the green rosella often doesn't look green at all. They are quite yellow when they age. And um, this one is a mature one and is particularly lovely and yellow in the rain. And you can see that gorgeous red crest over the forehead there. The green rosella is the largest rosella in Australia. And it's Latin, Platycercus caledonicus. It's got a lovely wee story behind it. Platy is broad, circus is tail. So Platypus is broad foot, Platycercus is broad tail, and you can see it is a lovely broad tail that you often see on the Rosellas as a good diagnostic if they're just sitting up on a branch and you can't quite tell what it is. And Caledonicus means Scotland. So we think it was all a typo from a someone believing that they came from New Caledonia and recording them wrong because the original specimen was the surgeon on board Captain Cook's ship and he collected it at Adventure Bay on Bruny Island and then he sadly died before he even made it back to Britain and the specimen passed through several hands and then eventually got classified by someone who really had kind of lost the thread of where it was from. So we have a Scottish Rosella residing in Tasmania which is rather When they're younger, they are green, hence the name. So this one's a bit younger, peeking out from among the, the fronds. And they are very, very sweet uh, and make a good deal more range of noises than some of the rosellas you may be used to in your area. The crimson rosella is pretty close genetically, but um, doesn't share any of those crimson colors down on our ones. They're either just this green or aging up into the yellow. We also get the Eastern Rosella, um, but we don't tend to see them much on Bruny Island. They've decided the rest of Tasmania is where they like to be. And here they are dancing about on top of some foliage. So you see them at all levels of the canopy. So they're really quite widespread and easy to fall across until of course you're looking for them and these guys are just picking at the seeds on the fireweed the native fireweed they'll also eat the blackberries and end up with them all down their front like toddlers just a total mess but we've even seen them eating the frond the spores on fronds of ferns which seems like it would take more energy to eat them than you'd get in calories back but they have found a way to make it work for them Sometimes these guys will be the ones who set off the alarm so that everyone else knows that there is trouble in the neighborhood. So with you, maybe it's a noisy miner that sets off the alarm for everyone else. But for us, sometimes it's the green rosellas that shout out if there's a wedgie coming by or a goshawk. Next one down, you may have noticed I'm kind of going by size. I started with the big guys and I'm getting a bit smaller. This is the yellow wattle bird. Now, one of its many endearing common names is vomit bird because of the less than delightful noise that it makes as it throws up in the treetops. Along with the black karawang, uh, the yellow water bird and the flame robin are some of the guys that we notice doing the most of the altitudinal migrations in Tasmania. So we see these guys most um, 
and they come back down the mountains and then we get a lot of the young ones playing and messing around and fighting and they do have fantastic yellow wattles so this stunning image by Chris Saras because every image Chris takes is stunning shows really wonderfully that bright yellow stomach and that really excellent wattle I mean the wattles are quite insanely long on some of these guys and you feel like they must get tangled up occasionally and be sore but uh, they seem to like them and you can see the tips get red at the end too and they're a bit older and this is the only other wattle bird we have down here the little wattle bird uh, the photos make it look like they're similar in size there but the little is quite a bit smaller the yellow is the largest wattle bird in australia and therefore the largest of the honey eaters and you can see in the latin they've chucked in paradoxa just to add to its quirkiness and unusual appearance then dropping down a notch we get to our three endemic honey eaters now this guy is one of my favorites, the yellow-throated honey eater. He makes a really recognizable series of sounds. About 18 different calls the yellow-throated honey eater has been recorded. Um, but the one you hear the most is this tonking, this thunk, thunk, thunk. And then sometimes he kicks into a bit of a machine gun and does the prrrr, like you'd know from a Lewins, if that's something that's local to you. He's not as much into hanging out with big flocks as the other two honey eaters. You're more likely to see this guy by himself. Uh, and that yellow gets stronger as they age. The back is a gorgeous olive green. But uh, if you get the back, you don't get the front in most photos. So I didn't get one that showed both. But the sunlight really shows up that gorgeous olive. They used to um, be uh, problems in orchards, or at least perceived to be problems in orchards. And so they have various nicknames along the line of cherry bird and such as well. Flavi is flame in Latin, so you can see the, uh, the second part of the name Flavicolis is yellow throat. But the other two of our honey eaters are not like in the stillness, they are melothripsis. And uh, melothripsis are the ones usually with the strong, shorter beaks rather than long curved beaks like um, Eastern spinebill or something that is more designed for fitting into a flower. These guys are more about gleaning across the bark, through the leaves, uh, looking for seeds and bugs, as well as taking lerps and physalids and nectar, they have a broad diet. And this beautiful marking on the strong build, really so gorgeous. And green down the back, similar to the yellow throat, but not quite as dominant. And then that eye to eye white band, just gorgeous. And Valadorostis being strong build, this adorable photo of two young ones back to back taken by Craig Smith. And you can see on their supercilium that it starts off quite yellowy and then it ages up to more blues and greens as they go. Very fluffy and adorable. And the other guys are the black headed honey eaters. So these also have a colored supercilium. They have the solid black head rather than the white band eye to eye. And then they have these sneaky little black shoulder pads, which are just very funky. And you hear the black headeds a lot singing from the treetops and they helpfully tell you their name. They say, black head, black head. It's a little two tone on one of their calls. And they call a lot to each other because they do tend to move in feeding flocks and they'll hang out with the strong builds as well i mean many eyes in many directions makes you look safer but they both have very slightly different approaches to how they're uh, looking for food as well so having more around means more things are being disturbed often with the blackheaders and the strong builds i am listening for the sound of the bark being ripped off the tree as much as i'm listening for the calls 
And whilst there can be other suspects ripping the bark, like maybe a grey shrike thrush up there getting busy, it will often lead you towards a strong build, especially if you hear the ripping of the bark. This was a pallid cuckoo chick being fed by a black-headed honeyeater, so the nest had clearly been parasitized. I never saw any other chicks with this parent, so it's possible that all the other chicks, its actual chicks, had uh, sadly not made it, and it was only this big, fat, pallid cuckoo taking all the resources. We, uh, we get four cuckoos coming down to us. Um, the Horsefield's bronze, the shining bronze, the pallid and the fan tail. And uh, they don't need to hang around for that long in Tasmania because they just turn up in the spring and lay their eggs and then they don't have to raise the chicks. So off they go again. But you do hear them for some in the summer as well. But it's one of the, the big signs that spring is here when the cuckoos start to arrive for us. And on to the robin. So the dusky robin is our endemic one. And he doesn't get any of the bright colours of the other robins that you'll know, the reds and the yellows and the pinks. He's lovely browns and greys. But his big diagnostic feature is on his face below, has got that black line, and then the line extends out past the eye as well as a nice little flick of mascara there. So even on a, a more distant sighting, uh, like Mark's lovely photo here, you can still see that line. And, and as they get older, you see the line more strongly. A young one can be quite confusing, as you'll see here. Um, it's, it's much more mottled, and you wouldn't notice that eye band. But there's lots of other features that tell you that this doesn't belong to the other robins. This is the four together that we have down here. The much beloved Scarlet Robin with his stunning red chest. And you can see the red stays high on the chest there and doesn't drift all the way down like on the Flame Robin where it's almost all the way to the vent. And the big white dot on the forehead of the Scarlet is a much smaller one on the Flame too. So once you've seen both of them, just once, you never make the mistake again. The females, though, it's quite another couple of fish. They take a little bit longer to get your eye in. And then the pink robin. Who doesn't love a pink robin? In fact, I love the pink robin so much, I'll be coming back to the pink robin later on. Now, the Tasmanian scrub wren. This is a kind of find the bird picture at first, and this is usually how you're going to see your scrub wren the first few times, because they live in the dark and the wet and the temperate rainforests and they're tricky wee things. So the next three birds are all LBJs, little brown jobs, or wee brown jobs if you're Scottish, and so they are often the ones that the non-birders are slightly less interested in and uh, where they think we're super weird when we're poking around in the dark places, but they are all much more rewarding to come across, of course. If you're more familiar with white-browed scrub wrens, you will know they're pretty confiding and fairly easy to find. Whereas the tazzy scrub wren doesn't give you such an easy pass. You actually have to work to find them usually. Sometimes they become pretty habituated to humans in a park or something. But if you're out in, in the bush by yourself, you may just hear them scooting away from you rather than staying close. So any photo of a scrub wren is a good photo. And the two little white bars show up oh, going the wrong way show up beautifully in this image of rammets and gulls uh, rammets another inala guide and he's based up in devonport and does amazing photography and you can see those two little white chevrons showing really nicely on that wing bar there it is pretty uniformly brown slightly darker on the top than the bottom often but not tricky to find. The Tasmanian thornbill is also not tricky to find, but this is one that is tricky for people to feel very confident that they have a correct ID on, especially if they're not with a guide. So the other um, thornbill we have is the brown thornbill. And when you first arrive and you've just got your guidebook, 
and you're desperately trying to look at all the features and they're scooting about in front of you at a million miles an hour, it can be tricky to feel confident. The first big indicator is the kind of habitat you're in. So if you're in wet habitat, you are more likely to be seeing a Tasmanian thornbill. And if you're in a dry sclerophyll forest, you're more likely to be seeing a brown thornbill. But we are full of ecotones and places where both exist. And often you'll get both very close together or even feeding together. So it's a good indicator is the habitat, but then you've got to move on to the next stage and that's the amazing call. And the call is so helpful because the Tasmanian thornbill does this beautiful musical with a little beep beep at the end. So gorgeous. Like somebody playing a flute underwater. It's really melodious and delightful. Whereas the brown is more just chipping and chapping and doing all the usual little small birdie noises. And it hasn't got that same beautiful roll to it. So you hear the calls is a very good start. And then you move on to lots of lovely features to look at. So we've got the Tassie and the brown next to each other there. The Tasmanian thornbill has got more alpha copper uh, on its forehead and it suffuses across the head more. The chest has got less uh, solid striations than the brown. Uh, the wing bar on the Tasmanian has got the uh, coppery brown showing, especially when the wings are together against the body. But the biggest and the best indicator for me is around under the bum is the white fluffy bloomers that the Tasmanian thornbill has and which the brown thornbill doesn't. So they both can have fluffy bloomers, all uh, the undertail coverts there, but it is on the brown never that pristine white. So as soon as you see the white, pure, pure white fluff under the bum, you can feel very confident that you've got a Tassie thornbill. Add in all the other features and the song and the habitat and your lion. Oh, I forgot to mention our third thornbill down here, which is the gorgeous little yellow rumped thornbill known as Butterbum to some and that tiny delightful drift of dandruff across the head on it as well. And the scrub tit. Now, these are photos by Alfred Schulte. He's a phenomenal photographer and a great friend of Anala. Nobody gets photos like this of the Tasmanian scrub tit. If you're feeling smug because you have one like this, then huge congratulations because they are the trickiest, in my opinion, to photograph. They're in the darkest places. Uh, they're in the absolute um, remnant rainforest pockets of which there are sadly less and less. And so to find a scrub tit is tricky enough, never mind photographing one. But you can see that gorgeous curved bill there, the lovely white of the throat, white around the eye, ringing it. And again, in the wing, it has two white chevrons. This is a classic positioning of a scrub tit too, that kind of sideways perch and pounce, like you might be used to from an Eastern yellow robin. And it's uh, fast and it's often at mid height and it doesn't have a great deal to say for itself. It's often pretty quiet. And so if you find one of these without a guide or a friend, well done, you're doing very well. Second picture here, just showing its lovely positioning. It's such a sweet little thing. Well worth the hunt. And finally in the 12, the 40 spotted hard alert. So this one is very dear to our heart. This is the totem bird for Inala. Tonya Cochrane bought um, the land at Inala on Bruni Island to protect it for future generations and to keep it safe, to prevent it being developed. And one of the main reasons that she bought that land was because there was a colony of 40 spotted pardalotes living there. Now, they are sadly in enormous trouble. Uh, their numbers are very, very low and dropping across most of Tasmania. And the reason they're in so much trouble is because they are reliant on one species of tree, which is Eucalyptus viminalis. And that is known as white gum or mana gum. And they have formed a relationship with this tree where they don't seem to want to feed on anything else. And so that can be problematic. It was more widespread as a tree uh, 
before European colonization. It's found in the fertile lowlands, so of course the more of the fertile lowlands that we have cleared, the less of the tree we have had, and therefore less of these wonderful forty spotted partloads. So, what to do? Firstly, know your partloads. We have two others down here. We have the wonderful striated partload, and we have the spotted partload. Spotted is many people's favourite bird of all. It's just so delightful, and the little red and orange around the bum is just perfection. The striated, we do have them year round in Tasmania, but we also get some that migrate back and forth across the strait, and ours all have the yellow on the wing. We don't get the ones with the red. The striateds are a smidgen bigger than the 40 spots, so when they turn up, they are also part of the challenges that the 40 spots face, because being that little bit bigger, they can be that little bit more bullying, and they can push them out of a nest hollow, or take the food or the territory. So we love our striateds, but we do wish they would leave the Viminalis for the 40 spots. The amazing ability that the 40 spots have is a tiny hook on the end of their beak, which they use to create sugars out of the tree. They actively farm the Viminalis. So they don't just go around and pick off sugar that is already sitting. They dig a tiny little hole, usually where the petiole is, where the stem and the leaf meet, and the sugar doesn't ooze out immediately. It can take hours, it can maybe take days, depending on the temperature and the season and what the tree is up to. And so the 40 spot is continually returning to those little holes to check. And uh, each time it comes back, it sees if there is a little tiny white nub of manna sitting there. And if there is, it snips it off. And if there isn't, maybe it will dig the hole a bit deeper, or maybe it will just move on. So not only are they tiny, they are 10 grams, but they are scooting about at a million miles an hour, checking all around their tree to see if they have food ready. Now, if there is two weeks of heavy rain, those sugars will wash off and that can be devastating for the 40 spots, especially if they're trying to feed their chicks at that time. So it's a, a tricky thing to be so reliant on one species. We have of course planted as many Viminalis as we can. Uh, Tonya has been giving Viminalis away to the community for many, many years. The marvellous conservation groups all around Tasmania have focused heavily on this. BirdLife Australia has done amazing work bringing people's attention to this. And so it is known that this part load is in trouble. And once it is known, then action does get taken. And so more and more people are putting up nest boxes, are planting Viminalis, are talking to their MPs and trying to stop Viminalis getting chopped down. So there is a growing momentum and we really hope it's not too late to save the wee part load. And the Difficult Bird Group is doing fantastic studies all around the place. Um, Kat Young from Difficult Bird Group is another guide with Inala, and then many others in, in the Difficult Bird Group are working on saving 40 spots, on researching on trailly parrots and swift parrots, and masked owls. So there's a lot of fantastic people doing excellent work. And many of those people turn up on our doorstep because Tanya has built this lovely platform that you can see on the bottom right there. And it gets you up to four meters high and lets you see these amazing little birds dancing around in the Viminalis rather than getting a very painful neck, trying to strain and see them at the top of the trees. You can see that gorgeous image by Andrew shows the chicks being fed through the hole of the nest box. And then these images by Fernanda Alves, also in the Difficult Bird Group, show her scooting up a tree. They can get up and down like lightning on their ropes, checking a nest box, and just seeing those lovely little chicks, which you can see there are still blind by the look of them, haven't got any feathers, very, very young. There are many challenges for the partloat, um, including a parasite which can be found, um, a subcutaneous parasite which gets under the skin of the chicks and uh, can kill them. So the, uh, the difficult bird group also, if they find a nest where the parasites are, they, they will remove them, give every little chick a fighting chance. 
Now that is our 12 endemics. So the other two that sometimes accidentally get called endemics for Tasmania are the breeding endemics. And the OBP is very, very famous. The orange-bellied parrot does not come to Bruni Island, only goes down to Melaleuca in the southwest wilderness. A remarkable place, a place that I'm very privileged to get to quite a few times a year and I highly recommend going to if you have the time. It is just amazing in itself and then seeing the orange belly parrots there while they're down there for the breeding season is of course the icing on the cake. They are such stunning birds, it's impossible not to love them, but when you know how much trouble they're in you love them a hundred times as much. For them, it's been uh, death by a thousand cuts in terms of impacts that have caused them to get to the low, low numbers they're at. And you could listen to an entire talk just on the OBP. Uh, and there is so many great resources. The BirdLife Australia has done great work with this. There was a wonderful movie made, uh, a little documentary movie made about the trouble that they have been through. But there is good news this year. Numbers have risen. Um, Craig Morley recently put out the report with the recent numbers and it seems much more positive and optimistic in many regards. So hopefully returning another corner for these wonderful parrots. They're just so, so very sweet. Occasionally people will um, mis-ID them thinking uh, they're usually seeing a um, blue-wing parrot, uh, which can look very similar. But that orange on the tummy is so very striking. And the other is the swift parrot. So the swift parrot is also a breeding endemic, also makes its way across the strait to breed in Tasmania and then returns to the southern reaches of Australia and a little bit up the east coast as well for the rest of the year. And they also are facing many challenges. Most of all is habitat loss, uh, both in Tasmania and where they return to on the mainland. Uh, they don't uh, have such a strong single relationship with the species as the 40 spot does, but their relationship with blue gums, uh, which is Eucalyptus globulus, and the black gums is very strong. And so where the blue gums are is where you'll find the swift parrots. In Tasmania, we have a sugar glider, and the sugar glider is not meant to be here and was introduced in the early 1800s, probably as a pet. And so the sugar glider was found uh, to be eating the swift parrots. It was crawling into the nest boxes and it was eating the chicks, it was eating the eggs, and it was eating the sitting female. So on Bruni Island, we do not have sugar gliders, and that makes Bruni one of the places that a swift parrot can come and breed without having that added element of risk. And so blue gums are found in great numbers on Bruni, and we hope to keep it that way. And so we're always uh, in discussion with people to make sure that there is no further habitat loss for, for the blue gums, and the white gums, and the black gums, to try and ensure that the swift parrots always have a refuge. There's currently a campaign, I believe, going on with BirdLife Australia, and I'm sure there may even be links popping up now in the chat box telling you about that, where you can get involved and help out and write letters to the right people and really try to solidify a future for this remarkable parrot. They sometimes get mixed up with the musks as well, but you can see that the swift parrot's red stretches all the way down its throat, whereas the musk has the red across the cheek there. And again, once you've seen them a few times, once you've been that lucky, you don't usually muddle them up after that. The difficult bird group, and here's a photo of Dee doing some measuring, have also been doing wonderful work with the swift parrots. And on Bruni, they have put up many, many nest boxes because one of the big reasons that they're in trouble is they have nowhere to nest. The old trees are gone, the remnant trees are gone, and so they don't have hollows. And they found putting up nest boxes um, has significantly helped in some areas. And there's been a big take up on North Bruni in a lot of the nest boxes they put up 
we have nest boxes all across Inala too, um, and less of those have been taken up, but we hope that that's a positive sign. We hope that's because there's more actual tree hollows that they are using there. Uh, we run a Bruny Island Bird Festival every two years, and I'll reference it again later with details of the next one, but uh, last one we had every swift parrot in the world seemed to arrive for the festival. It was absolutely heavenly. We had uh, First Dog on the Moon doing uh, a lovely lecture and he was talking about all the trouble that the swift parrot is in whilst outside a thousand swift parrots shouted in disagreement down on him. It was very lovely. And here's a little video of them doing their thing amongst foliage. And that is a blue gum flower that they're in there which then turns into that huge, wonderful blue gum seed. Right, so 12 endemics, two breeding endemics, and now I'm just going to uh, gush about some of the other birds on Bruni for the last few minutes. So this is just a wee map to show you where Bruni is, in case you're unfamiliar. We're at the bottom of the bottom of the bottom, the island of the island of the island. Uh, I am pretty much living where that red dot is. So, so very lucky. The island is famous for many reasons. It is a beautiful place. It has lots of gourmet food and wine. And then in the birding circles, it's known as an absolute highlight of any visit to Tasmania. It is uh, a site of international birding significance. And the habitats of Tasmania are rich and varied and Bruni condenses it one level further. We have so many different habitat types so close together and an incredible richness of bird life and wildlife. I mean, I'm not even mentioning so many of our incredible mammals, but things like the Eastern Quoll also have a refuge on, on Bruni. So it's such a fun. This is the iconic image that you may have seen on a million tourism ads, this is looking down the neck. So because I've got such limited time, I've simply chosen five different habitats and I'll show you a couple of the birds that are in each. This habitat here in the sand dunes on the neck has got penguins, little penguins. Um, it's a pretty small colony. We're very lucky to have them at all, um, especially considering that they do get visited quite a lot by tourists who are kept well away with a with the boardwalk, but still they may choose not to stay on the neck forever. Uh, it's a pretty small colony, but they're mixed in amongst short-tailed shearwaters, which is the predominant colony there. And lots of features have been done to help them to stay safely in this spot. BirdLife Tasmania has done excellent work working with government and roads, putting in culverts under the road here, making sure the boardwalks were up nice and safe, and they have plenty of cover. And they're so adorable to see and of course such a highlight for many people even the non-birders are usually completely smitten by a little penguin and then the short-tailed shearwaters in amongst them and these are Ardena tenuorostis had a name change used to be puffiness but puffiness is uh, white-headed in latin so they switch them around when you're out at sea seeing the short-tailed shearwaters in the tens of thousands, that is a remarkable sight. But one of my favorite things is being at dusk on the neck and seeing them all come in to roost for the night. So these guys have come from um, Alaska, the Aleutian Islands of Alaska, and they've traveled their way across the planet from one krill resource to another, which hopefully will remain. But of course, there are many, many issues with krill in the world at the moment. And they make this epic journey and breed in Tasmania and around the Australia and then make their way back again to Alaska. So it's one of the most incredible journeys. This is a gorgeous picture of a beach to lead us into two birds that live on beaches with us. Pied oyster catchers. We are, have good numbers on Bruni, really good numbers, and they're doing well. They face all the many challenges that things that live on beaches do, not least humans and dogs and cars, but they are in good numbers and often visitors are very pleasantly surprised how many pied oyster catchers we have. And then the hooded dotterel or hooded plover, so tiny, so magical. And 
so silly, at nesting in the middle of a beach, just making a little scrape right where everyone's going to be passing. I'm always amazed that they manage to raise their chicks in areas where there's so many people around. But we have a fantastic community on Bruni who care very much for their bird life and the school got involved and put up wonderful signs uh, letting people know that the hooded plovers are there and to look out for them and to have their dogs on a lead and so their numbers are precarious but uh, we still have a few around on Bruni which is wonderful. Showing a bit of heathland here, gorgeous shot up by the lighthouse. Sometimes we go up there to see the yellow-tailed black cockatoos nice and close. And so uh, this is a beautiful bird. You'll all know a cockatoo, the stunning noise they make as they sweep across the sky, apparently before storms are arriving. And then dancing on top of the heath is a tawny crowned honey eater which people always think of as being in windswept heathy places with the song just drifting across. Glorious little birds. We don't have a great deal of these and we're always so delighted to see one, which makes people laugh a lot if it's common in their area. And rainforest. So down here we are temperate rainforest. We have loads of these tree ferns, Dixonia antarctica, and in amongst them we have the pink robin. Too adorable to be real, but just perfection. Often high on people's list to see, as well as the 12 endemics, and often even trickier than all the 12 endemics. Very good at being invisible, despite being so, so wonderfully bright. Just glorious. And sneaky olive whistlers too is always a highlight of a walk amongst the rainforest. We have the golden whistlers, we have the gray shrike thrashes, the olive whistler is always the one that people would love to see. When I used to work up at O'Reilly's, I'd have to schlep at least eight, ten kilometers out through the rainforest to have a chance of seeing one. But here you're much more likely, if you're poking about in a bush for any length of time, to come across one of these glorious little guys. And finally, to the sky for the raptors. I only had to pick two to cram them in. And it was very hard, but how could you go past the wedge-tailed eagle? We have a subspecies down here in Tasmania, which is uh, Flayi, and so that makes it even more special. And it is the largest of all the birds in Australia, and the Tasmanian subspecies is larger than the Australian mainland one. And I mean, what can you say about wedge-tailed eagles that hasn't been said before? They're just such remarkable birds. We get to see them like this because we have at Anala um, a conservation effort where we remove all the uh, dead animals from the roads. Sadly, there is a lot of roadkill. And as well as trying to work towards reducing the roadkill, we also make sure we stop at everybody, check the pouch in case there's a wee one still alive. And if there is, we raise them at Anala and then we release them uh, once they're ready to go. And then the poor dead body goes out in the field. And that means that all the rats can come down and feed safely rather than feeding on the exact same body on the road and potentially getting hit by a car they can now come into an empty field and feed and so we also get to see the final bird here which is the grey goshawk this stunning image by Andrew Brown another amazing photographer and great friend of Anala uh, and I mean they're just amazing we only have the white morph down in Tasmania, so there are no grey, grey goshawks with us, and they're just pristine white. The only pure white raptor in the world, no black markings on it at all. And sometimes a complete mess when they've been right up to their face in the blood and guts of an animal, but usually very good at staying pretty clean. This is Whitey, the terribly unoriginally named grey goshawk that is resident at Anala. We see him an awful lot. And Mrs. Whitey, she is much bigger than him and comes in and dominates and he will always give way to her. And so pretty much every day we hear them peeping away somewhere outside, getting outraged at something. So I hope you uh, enjoyed that whistle stop tour of some of Tasmania's birds. I'm now going to ping over to some questions that I believe I'm going to get asked on my Facebook. This lovely little video here is another one by Brad Moriarty. 
with the 40 spotted pardlotes doing their thing. They're just perfection. Until um, so many photographers had um, looked at them so closely, we didn't even know some of the amazing attributes like the hook on the end of the beak. So the uh, incredible increase in photography in birders has got so many benefits in what we're learning about so many birds as well. And it's really helping with their conservation. Ah, first question. Best time to visit Bruni Island for birds. So we get people year round. Uh, because the raptors in winter are incredible. Uh, currently, of course, no one is allowed to be with us and we have them all to ourselves. But pretty much every day at the moment on Bruni, we are seeing an amazing array of raptors. Today, I have seen personally a white-bellied seagull, a great goshawk and a brown falcon. Uh, and most days we'll see at least three or four uh, raptors. So winter is amazing for that. And of course, the endemics don't go anywhere year round. But the vast majority of people do tend to come between September to March. And that is usually uh, because of weather as well as other features. I would just say avoid the school holidays. Uh, that is a, not a good time to come to Bruni because many of the other visitors to Bruni are not coming just for the bird life. So if you come on a long weekend or a school holiday, you may be banging up against the crowds a little more. Though usually you can find many glorious secluded places. The bird festival, which I was to get back to, is normally every October, specifically because it's such a fantastic time of year for birds. The many migrants have arrived as well. Swift parrots are here, hopefully, and everything is in full on breeding and uh, shouting season. Uh, this year we have decided to postpone uh, from October and we are just weighing up whether or not to go for March 2021 or October 2021. So we're just looking a little how the current situation plays out before we make our final decision on that and then we shall announce that too. So hopefully Tanya will ping up a couple of links to the Bird Festival website as well because it's great even if you can't make it to the Bird Festival because it's got all kinds of things like bird lists for the island and lots of links to amazing um, people who have previously generously spoken at the festival or artists who've been involved. It's a mecca of Tassie birding resource. Now, wedge tail population increasing. Now, the uh, best person in the world to talk to about wedge tailed eagles is Nick Mooney. He is also a guide with Anala and king of the raptors in Tasmania. And he's been doing a few talks lately, including for an amazing uh, project that's going on called Where Where Wedgie, where every year on one day, everybody goes out and looks at a different section of Tasmania and says whether or not they see uh, wedge-tailed eagle. Uh, we also record other birds on that day as well, but it's specifically to look at the wedges. And so not seeing one is just as important as seeing one for the records. Um, I believe that the numbers are not increasing as far as I know, sadly to tell you that. But I'd love to be corrected on that, but last time I heard, no. And that isn't just um, habitat loss for them, there's also issues of persecution sometimes um, and also accidental death, uh, which could be prevented from rodenticide um, and from electrocution. So as always, many challenges, many issues, many passionate, wonderful people doing a great job trying to re-educate and change policies and procedures and help them out. Any other questions popping in? Not at present. Well, I think I'm getting one. It's blinking at me. Uh, the name of the movie about the OBP. Now I should know that because the marvellous gentleman came to the Bruny Island Bird Festival and uh, someone frantically Google. Well, I'm ashamed that I 
point. Now we're going to end with that movie. I'm very sorry. Bit featured. All right. Well, I think I shall wrap it up. I'm not getting any more questions pinging in. Well, I hope I get to see some of you in person one day, uh, lurking around the bush somewhere in Tasmania. Uh, it is the best job in the world that I have, because uh, I get to gush all day long about all the beautiful things down here. And uh, as a place to be isolated, Bruni Island is pretty much the most heavenly place on earth. So thank you all for watching and take care. Stay safe. See you around.